prompt. All right, let me know when you want me to continue. Yeah, you're good. All right, sweet. So uh, getting back on track, um, what's our project for the, for, for the past three years and potentially moving into the future? Our project, so we know that enzymatic recycling is the ideal solution. Now, the major problem with enzymatic recycling is that the enzymes aren't super efficient. Um, if you think about evolution, um, plastics have only been around since 1950. It takes thousands, if not millions of generations for enzymes to improve in efficiency. Um, so since they've only been around plastics since 1950, the enzymes that break down plastics in the environment from bacteria are not very good uh, because they haven't had those thousands of generations to improve over time. And they haven't had the selective pressure they need um, that forces them to grow, uh, to, sorry, uh, to improve as much. So our goal is to use um, computational and um, rational methods in order to engineer these enzymes to be more efficient and hopefully efficient enough where they could be economically viable uh, for industrial use or pl industrial plastic degradation. Um, so there's a long way to go. Uh, by our calculation last year, I think we would need at least a 35-fold increase in enzymatic activity from the state of the art um, that is currently published in the literature. So this research has been going on for the past 10 to 20 years. And the best design that we know of um, is still at least 30 fold off. So there's still a lot to improve on. Um, and we're hoping that with our, our specific methods, um, especially from uh, computational design using ML from the dry lab and rational design from the wet lab, uh, we can design enzymes that are efficient enough to do that. And we can find them, right? So we have to also validate that okay, I made this design, I think it's good enough. Well, we need to actually prove that that enzyme design is as good as we're saying and um, efficient enough for industrial use. Okay, so let's get into some of the chemistry. How do these enzymes work? So we'll talk about two. Uh, these are the most famous ones, uh, pedase and metase. Um, the reason these are popular is because they work at um, what is called uh, mesophilic temperatures, which is like, um, like near uh, what, what's outside. So they work at 30 degrees Celsius, whereas other enzymes that break down plastics, especially PET, work at much higher temperatures. Um, so that's why these ones have gained, uh, garnered a lot of intent, uh, um, attention. So this is PET. This is the subunit of our plastic. So our PET plastic is, is a polymer made up of uh, like millions of subunits of this molecule right here called PET. So the PETACE enzyme, uh, hydrolyzes that PET into um, MHET. So it's a slightly different molecule, as you can see. Um, it breaks the bond between uh, PET subunits and adds uh, hydroxyl groups to the ends. Um, and from that, the secondary enzyme metase breaks it down into its monomers, ethylene glycol, um, which is commonly used in, in a lot of things. Uh, not only in, in breaking in making plastics, but also in things like antifreeze and terephthalic acid. So terephthalic acid is a main building block in um, plastic production. So essentially, these enzymes allow us to get a circular economy. We take ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid to make PET, and we make millions of subunits of this uh, to make a PET plastic, right? Then we use PETase to break that PET into MHET, and then metase to break that back down to ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid. So this, this could repeat infinitely and essentially we could recycle essentially all the plastics that we produce. Ideally, that's the ideal goal. Um, in terms of how pedase and metase look, uh, pedase is a singular domain uh, protein. Uh, I think it has, if I'm not mistaken, seven alpha helices and nine beta sheets. Um, and, uh, the active site, let me see if I can uh, turn on a pointer. I think I'm hoping you guys can see that. The active site is right near this loop here. Um, the reason these loops are important and they're held together by disulfide bonds is that um, they allow for um, the large molecule. So you can see this molecule is rather large. It has this really large uh, aromatic ring. Um, it allows this, this large PT molecule to kind of dock into the active site on the surface and um, be catalyzed. 
Metis is slightly different. It has two domains. It has um, this uh, alpha beta hydrolase domain, similar to the size of Pedase, but it also has this extra domain called the lid domain. So the reason this lid domain is super important is it makes it very selective to met. So this, in this regard, metase doesn't degrade PET, uh, which it is very inefficient at. It only degrades MHET. It's a very linear process, which is very important. Um, you should know that this lid domain makes metase extremely efficient and extremely um, uh, fixed for met, uh, whereas pedase itself is inefficient. So the focus is on uh, engineering pedase and similar hydrolases because the major um, blockage in this in this reaction pathway is this first is this first breakdown of the um, multiple subunits of PET into MET. Once you get here, METIS is very efficient. It's not really a problem. Uh, of course, there have been engineering attempts. We have even worked on it, but um, the main goal is still this PETIS. Once you can get past that problem, METIS is, can usually handle as much MET as U2OS. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so there's another important enzyme. So this was the enzyme I was mentioning earlier, uh, the most efficient one that we know today. It was published April 8th, 2020. Uh, it's called LCC or leaf uh, compost kinase. Um, and here you can see the PET molecule docked in here. And um, here's the, the active site is right. There's the serine. No, I think that's serine 165. Yeah, right here. Um, and that's uh, D210 and H242, I think, is the active site. Yes. Um, these are the three um, uh, residues that uh, perform a electron transfer mechanism in order to break the bond right here. So this is your PET molecule. Once you break this, this green thing right here is MET. Um, and that's your leaving group. You can see here, you cut here, and then you get MET left. Um, so that's how LCC works. It's similar to PETACE. And then once you have MET, then METACE would, would work on it. So it, it works exactly the same. It's just the most efficient one that we know of today. Okay. So we kind of have an idea of, of, of what's happening in the space. And we know the problem. Uh, there's a lot of plastic production. We need enzymes to break them down. But the enzymes aren't efficient enough. We need better enzymes to do that. So our goal is to increase the catalytic activity and thermostability of our enzymes. Catalytic activity is important to increase so that we can do this faster and hopefully in a way that it's economically efficient, right? Like your enzyme can't take two weeks to break down PET. It's got to work in a few hours to break down tons and tons of PET because we have a massive problem. Thermostability is important because we want to reuse our enzymes multiple times. Reproducing them all the time would be super inefficient and super costly. So thermostability is also very important. Now there's multiple ways we do this. Um, directed evolution is one approach um, that we might work on in the future. And it, it, it does this slowly, kind of climbs one step at a time, uh, improving slowly mirroring the evolutionary process. Machine learning, which we're using um, right now, and that's the focus of the dry lab, uh, uses statistical approaches to kind of predict this uh, fitness landscape to try and design the maximum variant. And then another approach we used last year, which is called multi mutant rational design, uh, essentially makes large um, number of mutations and hopes to jump from one peak to another um, by using computational software. Okay. So in 2020, because we didn't have access to the wet lab, um, we worked on the wet lab worked on rationally designing um, enzyme variants. Uh, specifically, we worked on PETACE, LCC, and META. Uh, the, the enzymes that I showed you. Uh, so this, there's a long process, but to make it very simple, essentially what we did was we took the, took the enzyme, uh, we tried to ident identify places where we could introduce disulfide bonds, uh, which are these um, chemical, which are these like bridges of cysteine residues um, that stabilize an enzyme, essentially. Um, they make it very stable. Um, once we did that, we wanted to optimize the confirmation of it. So um, it's obviously it's very hard to predict exactly how the enzyme uh, will look on a computer rather than in real life, because um, you, you're going to need like some really powerful um, tools to do that. So uh, the way we do that is using this pro program called Rosetta Relax, and that's to mirror the confirmation it hopefully has uh, in, in the lab. 
Then we dock the ligand. So a ligand is uh, the substrate, which is PET in this case. So we wanted to dock it onto um, our, um, our enzyme. So we have the design of the enzyme now. Now we want to dock the, the ligand on it so we know how in, the ligand is interacting with our enzyme. And then we try to identify um, amino acids that we could engineer so that the interaction and the catalytic activity would improve. Uh, so we use multiple tools to generate a list of, of single mutations that would do this. Um, and specifically, we use Rosetta and uh, Rosetta to do this. Then we filtered out those designs um, using Abacus and Protein Solver. So what those tools do is they tell us what amino acids need to be in certain configurations in the protein so that it folds properly. So that it actually, so it's great to have this design, but if it will actually form in, in real life in the lab is important. So there's actually technologies um, that can identify that with mutations. So then we whittled down the number of mutations that we'd want to target. Then we used a tool called Protein Repair One, Shop, One Stop Shop. What that does is it looks away from the active site. So it doesn't work on catalytic activity, but it works on stabilizing uh, the protein. So it can stabilize the protein by finding um, new positive interactions, like what you would think of as basic things like hydrogen bonding, uh, interactions between amino acids, and um, improving the hydrophobic core. So the insides of the protein are, are hydrophobic, and they have this hydrophobic interaction. So all your intramolecular forces um, that's kind of what it focuses on doing. And then lastly, we had whittled down these mutations uh, that were suggested um, from these design programs. And then we wanted to use this program called Funklib to identify whether we could actually combine these mutations together to make an enzyme variant with like multiple mutations that are hopefully um, beneficial to its catalytic activity. So while PROS focused on improving stability, Pros and disulfide bronze improved the stability. Funklib um, was key in essentially identifying how to improve the catalytic activity. So we take this list that's been filtered down of mutations that will actually allow the protein to fold properly, and we um, use Funklib to combine them. And what Funklib does essentially, it does what's called a multiple sequence alignment. So it looks at PETACE and other very similar um, proteins, uh, other similar hydrolases, and it says, okay, well, if all of them have an A at this position, well, it's probably super, super important that we keep that A there um, so that it folds properly, right? Because otherwise, why would it, why would it not have, why would all of the all of these sequences have an A? So it does that. Um, and then it also identifies uh, locations that um, are different between a bunch of these similar enzymes, because these are locations where a mutation might be very beneficial. Um, then it also does, um, it uses the Rosetta energy function to kind of identify um, whether um, combining these mutations would actually be beneficial or combining the mutations would have negative effects on each other. So you can imagine a situation where one mutation might be beneficial and another single mutation might be beneficial. But when you combine them together, they change the protein so much that they're actually negative. So it, it tries to filter the, that out. And then uh, once it does that and kind of identifies um, the, how this would affect the catalytic activity, then it ranks um, the total energy of the uh, protein ligand interaction and um, allows us to see what are the best designs. So that's kind of how it works. Um, that's a bit complicated, but to make it simple, um, we identify mutations that are, that are stabilizing, that are away from the active site, and then we identify mutations that improve the catalytic activity in the active site. And we combine those together into one protein and we try and make sure that it folds properly. Um, so that's how we designed, uh, um, how we designed proteins uh, last year in the wet lab. And here's one of the examples. So this is our LCC design uh, from last year and it includes 32 mutations and is predicted to be 50 kilojoules per mole more stable than the wild type, which is like a massive increase. And then uh, the dry lab team last year, uh, actually took some of our designs, I think specifically our PETACE design, and um, did a molecular dynamic simulation, which is essentially simulating um, the interaction of the ligand with, with our enzyme design. And they plotted the distance uh, between um, the, the, bond that's the, bro the bond that's broken, which is um, an ester bond um, on, um, 
the last uh, MET subunit, as, as we discussed. And uh, essentially, they map the distance between that, um, that the carbon in, in the ester bond that's broken um, and uh, the serine in the active site. And you can see that our design was much closer um, between the serine and, and that it's called an alpha carbonyl um, than in the wild type, which um, other research has suggested that that probably produces an enzyme variant that is, has a higher catalytic activity. Um, this isn't confirmed, but it is a good method of in silico uh, testing um, and evaluation. Okay, so let's actually talk about in lab in lab approaches. So we didn't have access to the lab in 2020, but we did have access to the lab in 2019. And in 2019, we we're kind of just trying to figure out exactly how we're going to approach this problem. Um, so the first thing the team designed was a, a plasmid that allows them um, to insert their enzyme designs, um, which they made in 2019, into bacteria so that they could assess whether the catalytic activity was high or not. Because it's great to say that on paper it is, but then you actually got to test it to see in lab if it does. So the way that they did that was they they um, put the plasmid, in, I mean, sorry, they put the en their enzyme design in a uh, multiple cloning site. So they put it in, in a plasmid and uh, the plasmid was called, I think it's called the PET22B plasmid. Uh, the reason they use this plasmid is because it has a uh, PEL-B or LAM-B signal sequence so that the enzyme is secreted. Um, Secretion is important so that we can test the enzyme directly. We're not, in, in order to test an enzyme, you need to get it out. So uh, secretion is very helpful for doing that. It also uses a T7 promoter. Um, essentially, it's a really good promoter. That means that you get a lot of the enzyme is good expression. And they used uh, LAC I and, and LAC not, so LAC operon. Uh, this is important so that you can induce the expression. Because uh, you can imagine that producing a lot of a foreign enzyme in a bacteria that's never had that enzyme before could be detrimental to that bacteria. Um, imagine if uh, you were to produce um, some random uh, enzyme in you, like that would not be very healthy for you. So essentially this allows us to control uh, when we want to uh, express, express um, the enzyme. There's also a his tag. This is important for, for purification, affinity purification to be specific. And there's an ampicillin resistance for selection of successful transformation. So they transform um, their enzyme design in, they purify out the enzyme, and then they use a P-nitrophenobutyrate hydrolysis assay. Uh, to make this simple, essentially P-nitrophenobutyrate is a chemical that looks very similar to PET. The only difference is that it releases light when it's broken down. So it allows us to assess how good our enzymes are because it mirrors PET, but when it's broken down, it, it releases light. So we know exactly how efficient it is. And so they did this assay and they over time um, identified that their designs, uh, which are yellow to green here, all of these ones were better than the wild type. Um, but unfortunately at the time, it wasn't better than the best one at the time. So the best one at the time was this W159H S238F, uh, design that has obviously been surpassed uh, now, but um, at that year, that was the best. So they were close. There was definitely a lot of improvement over wild type, uh, but we unfortunately didn't surpass it. But it was a good, it was a good start. Uh, so in 2021, um, our goal is to screen our enzyme designs because we want to get a state of the art enzyme. Um, but we've kind of in, in, um, added a few more assays to better determine how good our enzymes are. So the, the beginning process is, is very similar. So essentially we take our enzyme design, so they could be red or blue, and we, um, we order the sequences from a synthesizer. So companies will synthesize your, your DNA sequence. And uh, we use Gibson assembly to put them in our PET22B plasmid. So now we have our plasmid with our enzyme in it. Great. So now we have our plasmid, we transform it into bacteria. So most likely DH5-alpha or T7, and we culture it. And then we use mini prep to get multiple copies. So instead of having um, our one or two plasmids that have our, our, our enzyme in it, now we have millions of them. Great. Okay, once we do that, now we need to actually get our enzyme out. So we can use protein affinity chromatography to do that. Essentially our, um, our enzyme, when it's, 
actually being produced in, in the bacteria we have. Um, it has a, what's called a, the hexahistidine tag, which are a bunch of histidines at the back of the, the protein, which um, if you know anything about histidine, it reacts really well with um, uh, nickel NTA. Um, so it will bind very tightly um, to these nickel NTA beads. So here, imagine these are all the proteins and then this one is our, our petase, right? The, the pentagon is our petase. So all the other proteins are gone. And then we can use something called imidazole, which uh, binds better than our protein to these beads and actually washes them out um, to get our, our target protein out um, and get it very nicely purified. Great. So now we have our protein. Perfect. So next thing to do is assess how much of our protein is produced because we need to control the exact amount we want in, in our, in our um, assay. So there's multiple ways to do this. Um, one way to do it is through a Bradford assay, um, which is essentially coupling our protein with um, this molecule called Kumasi blue, and then um, using a spectrophotometer to determine um, the absorbance, which will allow us to tell the concentration. Uh, it's pretty simple, um, just molecule binds and we can detect this molecule. So it'll tell us how much protein, how much protein. Great. Okay. Now we can also do the same thing that we did last year, which is this, P-nitrophenylbutyrate assay, and here again, you can see P-nitrophenylbutyrate. It has very similar uh, design to uh, PET. Uh, you can see the aromatic ring and um, the ester bond. Um, but uh, the difference is that it has this uh, nitro, nitro group uh, right here that when it's catalyzed by PETase, so any lipase or esterase, but PETase, for example, it will uh, release this P-nitrophenylate ion, uh, which is detectable. Uh, with spectrophotometer, and we would get a similar graph uh, to this to determine our enzyme activity. But, so that was kind of the same as 2019. Now in 2021, we're adding a much, uh, a very important step, which is something that mirrors HPLC. So HPLC, high, high performance liquid chromatography, kind of allows you to assess um, if you actually put PET with your enzyme, actual PET, not just this mirroring uh, molecule, what does it break it down into? So does it break it down into BHET, which is two METs together? Does it break it down into TPA all the way down? Um, remember, which is a further breakdown product of MET, or does it break it down into to MET itself? So it allows us to assess exactly what's being broken down um, using UV. And so um, HPLC though is like a very expensive and technical piece of equipment. So instead we'd like we are gonna use a method designed um, by a lab at MIT um, that essentially allows us to do the same thing, um, but instead using much simpler uh, equipment, equipment, which is just some tubes, PT, um, actual PT flakes, and um, a, an equipment called a spectrophotometer or nanodrop. So this will tell us, rather than kind of telling us, oh, a similar ion emits this much uh, light, we'll know exactly what our PET is being broken down into. Uh, which is super helpful to, for us to determine um, how good our enzyme is and how it compares to other enzymes and um, how useful it might be in, um, in, in uh, an industrial purpose. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the goal of, of this year's wet lab team is to screen all of these different designs that we have and determine if we have an enzyme that is close to or better than state of the art, um, which would make it obviously very interesting and important for research and uh, people interested in industrial uh, PET uh, recycling. Now, there's another thing that, that this method allows us to do, which is uh, feedback with the dry lab. So the dry lab obviously contributes a lot to our designs. Now, when we test the designs, uh, essentially that allows them to uh, modify their models. As I told you earlier, they use statistical methods uh, to try and predict the uh, landscape of, of um, how good an enzyme variant will be. Um, so we'll test their designs and tell them how good they actually were in lab. And that will allow them to modify um, their programs so that they could um, propose better designs. Uh, so that's something that's very important for us to see. Great. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, sorry, this is our presentation from last year. You can go ahead and watch it if you'd like um, on your own time, but uh, yeah. Uh, Here's our presentation from last year if you want to know a little bit more about um, what happened in 
Um, 2020 or 2019, I'm not exactly sure. Anyways, uh, that's kind of everything. If there are any questions, uh, feel free to just ask right now. A great presentation, Joseph, very clear um, and understandable. I, I do have one question. So for the nano drop method, it's what's, what's the absorbance it's measuring? Like what um, is it's it at, measuring? B hat? Oh, sorry. It, it uh, essentially can measure, it can determine between, um, so sorry, the nano drop method is interesting. The nano drop method allows us to determine total absorbance from B hat, MET, and TPA. But um, uh, using uh, standard curves, um, so essentially we, we purchase B hat, MET, and TPA, and we can use a standard curve to determine um, what their absorbance is so that we can determine their relative contribution to the total absorbance. I see. And you can do this essentially, I, I see on the slide, it was you measure it like at intervals in time. Exactly, yeah. So what the, the cool thing about nanodrop, it, it takes like one microliter of a reaction, which is like very little. Um, so uh, you can take it like in time and it won't ruin your overall reaction or affect the concentration. Um, whereas most other methods obviously take a much larger quantity. Cool. Any other questions? Hi, Joseph. Yes. yes. Sorry, um, hi, this is Mia. Uh, hi. So I'm one of the audience. So thank you very much for your presentation. It's absolutely amazing how much um, the research has been done. It's very, very thorough, and I can see um, how useful it would be. Um, personally, I'm very curious about the programming side and the machine learning side of um, this dry lab. and I was wondering like how, what kind of um, software or like programming because I I'm new to this and I just wonder like where where did I start and how how do you like what kind of I know you use some kind of a package right but is this like Python or how do you so, do that? So Tian Yu can give you a great answer and I think he'll also have a dry lab presentation where he'll go super in depth on that topic uh, so I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, so great to hear that you're interested uh, in the dry lab side. Um, we will have a dry lab research overview next Friday uh, at the same time, so 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Or actually, it's Eastern Daylight Time now, so actually my time was wrong. It's supposed to be EDT. Um, so in terms of software, I we generally code in Python and um, the machine learning libraries right now, mostly PyTorch. So currently what we're doing, well, I can go into more depth next week, but just very briefly, um, what we're doing is essentially repurposing some um, other PhD students code and adapting that to our project, to be like completely honest with you. Um, there are instances where we are trying out novel methods, um, but it's it's still very much based on uh, the, the research that has already been done in machine learning for protein design, which has been this exploding field in this last, just the last two years. So yeah, you can find more about this uh, next Friday. Yes, thank you so much. That'd be awesome. I'm super excited to hear the presentation next week. Um, just one more follow up question. Did you generate that protein structure in the presentation? Did you guys? And was it using PyMo? Um, the headache one? There's a gray one that talks about how much. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The gray one from LCC. Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, the rational design pipeline. So um, the final tool, Funklib, outputs not only like the final sequence, but it also out, up, up, releases a PDB file um, with the proposed structure um, that's in a Ro Rosetta Relax confirmation. Um, so, I mean, obviously we haven't crystallized it, so we can't be 100% sure it's accurate, but um, we can be pretty sure because 
I mean, if you've ever used Pymol, you know that if you make a mutation, then there's like certain cleanup methods that kind of have like a very high likelihood that this is how the, re the relaxed structure will look. Um, so yeah, essentially it outputs uh, the structure. Um, if we get a really good design, uh, we can crystallize it or, or use cryo-EM uh, to find it. But uh, first let's determine if we have any good designs. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's, it's been great. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for coming, appreciate it. Any other questions? Cool. So I guess there's nobody has any questions. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a really clear presenter who adds a, quite a few ums and uhs, but, but uh, yeah, uh, maybe I get my point across. I don't know. <laughs> All right, then. I guess if there are no other questions, then I'll stop sharing. Um, hopefully,